Good morning, uh, I'm Eugene, and this is Byron and Kim Fa. We'll be presenting on selective attention theory today, something which we all practice uh, in our everyday lives. So I think everyone can relate to it. But before I begin, here's a video for you guys uh, to test your selective attention. How many gumdrops is the person eating? So anyone knows, or can make a correct guess, what? Seven. Seven. Well, wrong. The answer is actually six. Um, the answer is actually six, but I'm not going to go into details on why or how is it six. You guys can check it out. Uh, the video link is provided. But um, you guys probably uh, found yourselves focusing on a person eating and perhaps ignoring the other distractions in the video, like um, the gorilla, which is pretty much what selective attention is about. Now, um, a visual scene. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So a visual scene, which is basically uh, what we see, um, contains subjects that can be processed for action. However, more often than not, we are presented with way more information that can be processed at any given point in time. So to cope with this, um, our brains are equipped with attentional mechanisms to select or rather to. <laughs> To deselect uh, certain objects in the scene, to eat the scene. So as you can see, those unimportant or irrelevant objects are basically grayed out. Now, um, so this entire process of uh, selecting simultaneous objects in the visual scene or rather sources of information, um, either through enhancing them or suppressing them, or even both, is widely known as selective attention. Now, like I mentioned earlier, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, we all practice um, some form of selective attention um, every single day. So it's not surprising that uh, it applies in the context of HCI as well. Take games, for example, or more specifically, um, platform games, say like Mario or Portal, where players typically have to avoid or dodge obstacles in the games. And you'll find that these players' uh, attention is normally diverted towards um, avoiding the immediate obstacles. So other elements in a stage like the background or this progress information is mostly almost always ignored by the players themselves. Now another example in relation to HDI is the very common um, searching for content on the web. But I'm not going to talk about uh, searching for text content since I think everyone here uses control app and not and there's not much of selective attention going on compared to searching for other things like images. So but um, in the event where you're searching for an image and you know its pixel dimensions, its size, its color, and perhaps it's a 200 by 200 pixel space portrait, and you know its, you know its color as well, which is probably largely red, uh, largely red in color. So your mind automatically excludes any images um, that don't conform to these conditions, and at the same time, it enhances the processing of images that meets the criteria which I just mentioned. Now, um, although what I've mentioned so far largely relates to the visual aspect, um, selective attention theory isn't necessarily pertinent to just the visual field. It also extends to other areas as well, such as audio, which also holds similarities in the process. But just for today's presentation, we'll only be focusing on the visual aspect. Um, so, going to details and going to details on selective visual attention, there are basically two different forms of orienting your attention onto objects, namely overt and covert. And this concept is really simple. Um, overt orienting simply refers to shifting your attention onto objects that has detectable body movements like say um, your eyes or your head, while covert on the other hand refers to shifting your attention uh, without any observable body movements. Um, do take note though that sometimes eye motions can be really fast and invisible to the naked eye that people perceive and interpret it as an overt orientation rather than a covert one when it is in fact um, the latter. So although sometimes eye motions can be interpreted as either or both, um, there is still a dichotomy between these two aspects. Uh, before I hand over to Ryan, uh, everything that I've mentioned right from the beginning, they occur at different points of the selective attention, but 
The whole process of this that we um, consists of only two hierarchical independent stages. In the first stage, um, basically attention is divided uniformly over the entire visual scene, and information is basically performed in parallel. Whereas in the second stage, it operates with a limited capacity, uh, concentrating on only one or at most a few objects inside the visual scene. So any objects or items that are passed from the first to the second stage, they are considered to be um, selected. Now you guys can probably already tell that the transition from the first to the second stage is somewhat analogous to a spotlight, which I'll hand over to Ryan right now to go into details on the spotlight model. Thanks, Eugene. Okay, so um, uh, there are two popular models to describe how um, visual attention operates. The first of which is called the spotlight model as analogized by this psychologist by the name of Michael Posner in 1980. So this um, metaphor was derived by an introspective feeling that somehow attention could be, be deployed, somewhat like a beam of mental light to reveal what was hidden in the world. So to test this, Posner conducted a series of experiments um, in which Participants were asked to identify a target item in a visual space under two different conditions. Under the first condition, participants were not cued to where the target object would appear. Under the second condition, uh, the participant would be cued as to where the target object would appear. The time taken for the participants to identify this, the target object would then be measured. So now I would like to conduct a live demo of the experiment that Posner Carried out. Um, can I have Victor as my volunteer? Yeah, okay, you can see that. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, this is your visual space, these four quadrants over here. So, this is under condition one. You will not be cute as to where the target object will appear. The target object for this experiment is an alphabet, so it can appear on any one of the four quadrants. So, what I would like you to do is when you see, when you identify the object, can you just say it out? Okay, here we go. A. Okay. Yeah. Alright, this is the. Okay, this is the first. This is the first condition. So, uh, moving on to the second condition. With queuing, so that dot there is your queue. That dot indicates that the next target object, another alphabet, will appear in the bottom right quadrant. So, same thing when you identify it, you say it up. And, yeah, I know, okay, this, this doesn't sound, this experiment sounds, looks very lame, but, okay, uh, Posner carried out a series of these experiments. <laughs> Thanks, Victor. Okay, uh, okay um, Posner carried out a series of these experiments and he analyzed the results. So what he found out was that participants under um, condition one where they were not cute took generally a longer time as opposed to participants under condition two where they were cute. So this shows that there is a, having advanced knowledge of the uh, target location results in an increase in performance as we see a significant reduction in time when we compare participants from uh, condition 1 and condition 2. And this um, reduction in time is largely related to the relative location of the target object to the location of the queue. When we see that um, the greatest reduction in time happens when the target object is exactly at the same location as the queue. So, uh, Posner then, this led Posner to describe um, attention as a deployable spotlight and the cue in this experiment triggers the formation of such a spotlight. Um, that spotlight there was the position of the cue before. So and anything that is inside this spotlight is attended to. So now we look at the spotlight in detail. In 1890, another psychologist by the name of William James, he described attention as having a focus a fringe as well as a margin. So we, if we adapt this concept into the spotlight model, this is what we would roughly get. So as we see over here, right in the middle, um, this is the focus where information is extracted in high resolution, the word nosh here in this case. Now surrounding it would be the fringe where information is extracted in a less, uh, in lower resolution, in a more crude fashion. And this fringe extends up to the margin, which is the cutoff boundary of our attention. So uh, this queuing experiment also allows us to explore the two different types of attention, namely exogenous and endogenous attention, by um, introducing two types of cues. So the first type of cue, the first type of um, 
attention, exogenous attention, as the name suggests, uh, it is driven by external factors, more specifically external stimuli. So exogenous cues are cues which um, draw attention automatically in a less controlled fashion. On the other hand, we have endogenous attention, where it is goal-driven and is more <coughs> driven, determined by internal instructions. And so ex endogenous cues are cues which send attention to a specific location in a more controlled manner. So this is an example of an exogenous cue, as we saw earlier, um, this talk over here. It doesn't, re as, as Victor has shown, I mean, yeah, it doesn't require any interpretation on this part as the, the target is at the Q location itself. For an, this is an example of an endogenous cue. This arrow over here, um, any observer would be required to interpret the cue in order to determine the target location, which is the position at which uh, the arrow is pointing at. So finally, before we move on to the zoom lens model, I would like to leave you with some food for thought. Um, okay. While the spotlight model is useful in helping us to understand selective attention better, it does run into difficulties when dealing with 3D layouts. Um, as the model has only been validated for a 2D space, um, we need to think about how we can adapt, or can we even adapt this model to accommodate the additional dimension. And this, it will definitely be something for us to think about. Secondly, um, recent study has also shown that it is possible for us to actually allocate our attention to up to four to five independent objects. So what that could potentially mean is our attentional spotlight could be divided into up to four to five independent beams. So what implications does this have on us as HCI practitioners? Finally, um, experiments have also shown that selective attention cannot be space-based, but rather they are object-based instead. So um, such developments are, are, could potentially have a significant impact on our practices and should not be carelessly ignored. So now um, I'll let's have Sean who will talk about the second model of visual attention, the zoom lens model. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian. So before I move into the zoom lens model, uh, I'd like you all to recall uh, the previous experiment on uh, the four quadrants. So in the second uh, in the second part where you were cute. Uh, your spotlight is mainly focused on the lower lower left hand quadrant of uh, of the whole thing. But does that mean that when you were not cute, you were not able to find uh, an alphabet that was elsewhere in the uh, elsewhere in another quadrant? That was not the case apparently, right, Victor? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you could still find the letter. Why? Because you all still had you still had your attention paid to the whole screen, and that was the entire four quadrants of it. This led, uh, this inadequacy uh, led uh, Ericsson and St. James to come up with an alternative model, uh, which is a zoom lens model. It, it, they didn't say that the spotlight model is incorrect. Instead, it is, it is uh, correct, just inadequate, insufficient, in that they propose that uh, instead of just being a spotlight, our attention is more like a zoom lens, like a camera lens where you can you can focus on a large area or you can zoom in on a smaller area. And they propose a second feature of our attention is that as human beings we have limited mental resources uh, to focus on any given visual stimuli. So you have limited uh, resources on one hand, scarcity, and you have uh, a visual field to zoom in and zoom out on on the other hand. So what this leads to is uh, two aspects of our attention. Uh, we have the size of our attentional focus uh, that is inversely proportional to the efficiency of processing. So let us perform a little uh, demonstration here on how this is true. So this is a very simple children game that uh, a lot of people know of uh, finding, uh, finding Waldo, West Waldo, right? So in a given picture like that, you're supposed to find a Waldo who is this character over here. Okay, so if you look at the picture, there are a lot of things for you to focus on and it is not easy for you to find Waldo. But let's say if I zoom in onto this particular spot on the picture, um, Waldo is very apparently just over here, this character over here. In, uh, okay, he's in another color, he's in yellow and green. So as you can see, when you are focusing on a smaller area, you are able to find a given person, uh, a given picture, a uh, given target, uh, at a more high, uh, at a more efficient rate. 
Nevertheless, it still takes time for you to find uh, whatever you want, your target picture, be it actually Waldo or um, any other characters here. Uh, these are what we call the uh, these are what we call noise elements. And um, noise elements in this case appears in the form of other humanoid uh, figures that are similar to the target that you're trying to find. So this is zoom lens model. And as a computer scientist, you may be wondering, all oh, this zoom lens model, this spotlight model, this psychological theories, how are they applicable to computer scientists like us? So uh, we, are, uh, we design a lot of user interface in uh, our projects. And uh, what we do is, um, we, all, we all study and we all know that um, a user interface affects the usability of a product uh, very much. And uh, given the theories that we have here, button design and icon placement, uh, you can place them in places where you would expect attention to be put on by the user. And that would actually help them to know how to navigate your website or your um, app interface app interface a lot better. Also even if you're not designing uh, also if you even if you're not designing user interface, uh, putting ads is putting ads you can also use these theories when you are putting ads on your website. Thematic integration means that you are putting uh, thematically similar object uh, advertisements on your website such as having Nike or uh, Adidas advertisements on a football website. Format integration is just as I say, a Google web search where they place their ads, they place their ads in, congru uh, in conjunction with their search results. You, the users definitely have their attention on this uh, advertisement as they are uh, congruent to the things, the targets that they are searching for. So, uh, whether they click on the advertisement is another story, but at least you have their attention there, and that's the first step to placing ad uh, ads. So lastly, I'm going to move on to other visual phenomena. Uh, the spotlight model and the zoom lens model are not um, are not comprehensive in understanding human attention. So there's also uh, other factors such as inattentional blindness as well as the visible uh, attentional spotlight. Just as uh, Ryan has mentioned earlier, that uh, human uh, as human beings, we are able to multitask our attention onto up to three or four different areas at the same time. So with this, I'll end uh, today's presentation. Uh, if there's any question, we'll be over here to take them. Thank you.